So if you've never heard of this concept of the third place, this is actually a concept in sociology that has spread to, um, to the business world, to architecture, and it's really just found its way all over the place. And it's amazing because we see this really all over the ancient world. But in modern times, we're rediscovering it. And so I forget the name of the sociologist who developed this, but he defined the first place as your home. All right, that's your primary place. The second place is work. And that's the other place you spend most of your time, right? Well, the third place is the place that is neither home nor your work. The place where you go because it's neither of those places. It's not your private little sanctuary. It's not the place you have to be. It's the place where you go and hang out with friends and meet new people and really just have a grand time. So characteristics of a third place are that the people who are there have no obligation to be there, right? So think of, and the classic example, if you're old enough to remember it, is Cheers, where everybody knows your name. Everyone's, you know, favorite neighborhood bar. And it's the kind of place where a doctor, a CPA, and a postal worker will all sit next to each other, play darts together, have conversation, get to know one another. And you wouldn't see that any other place. They're definitely not meeting at home. They're certainly not meeting at work, but they're gonna meet at Cheers. So you might think of a bar. Other examples are a library or a church, a cafe, bookstore, maybe an arcade if you're old enough to remember those. Classic examples of a barber shop or a laundromat. Um, maybe you go to the gym. Maybe that's where you meet up with people and talk and make your business deals. Probably not a golf course. But in Jesus' day, this would have been the well. Do you know that during the war in Afghanistan, the U.S. Army tried to install running water in the homes of people living in the capital city there. And people kept blowing up the pipes, and they didn't know why. And so they put cameras on the construction site, and they found out that women were blowing up the pipes every night because they didn't want running water in their homes. Because if they had running water, they wouldn't be able to go to the well. They wouldn't meet other women at the well every day. They would be stuck in their homes. They would only ever see their husbands and children every day. The U.S. Army was taking away their third place, their place where they can be home away from home, meet their friends, meet people they have something in common with. People who aren't their husband and children. <laughs> so that is the third place. It's a neutral ground. It's a place where people can go and participate. There are no prerequisites. There's no social status. And the primary activity is conversation. Although you think, oh, well, the primary activity is drawing water. Well, that takes a couple minutes, and then you're there for the rest of the time just talking. It's a place that provides comfort and accommodation. You think of Jesus and the woman at the well, right? And he says, says to her, do you have anything to eat? Can you draw some water for me? That's comfort and accommodation. A third place has regulars. And third places are necessarily wholesome. So even though your neighborhood bar can be a third place, the strip club with its amazing wings, probably not a third place, <laughs> no matter how amazing the wings are. And lastly, it must be a home away from home. People there have to feel emotionally invested in the place. 
You have to feel a sense of belonging to it. You have to feel like this is your family, this is your home, and, and people there want to see you, and they miss you when you're gone. And that's why the church is the third place. That's what makes this the third place. Although since we're a house church, technically we're all three places at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Unique among third places, I know. <laughs> but I wouldn't be a good preacher if I didn't show you that this is exactly the kind of church that Jesus wants. That Jesus wants this third place. And maybe Jesus didn't think of a place with steeples and with stained glass and with organs and with pews. You know? Is that a good third place? I mean, look at this picture I have for you. Do those look like really good pew setup right there? Honestly, I think I would have trouble giving a sermon in that room. But that's a good third place, and that's what Jesus wanted to set up. So let's start in Luke chapter 5. Actually, so was in the bathroom. And it starts with eating and drinking. And when I told you I was going to approve of our uh, drunken gluttonous parties here, here's your passage. Uh, Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd was eating with them. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with sinners? Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, if Jesus isn't going to the kind of parties they go to, he's not going to reach them. If you can't eat and drink and be happy, you're not going to reach sinners. So, I don't necessarily approve of drunkenness, but I don't necessarily disapprove of it either. I think Jesus had to at least approach that line every now and then if he was going to reach any of these people. He had to go to their parties, not bring them to his. The next example we see in Luke chapter 10 is of Mar Mary and Martha. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She wanted to hear him preach after all. I know the feeling. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She, this sounds like my sister. It sounds like my mom. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to do all the work by myself? Ooh, that is my sister's tongue. Okay, tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. In other words, Jesus' third place needs to be a place where we can learn, where we can teach, where we can discuss ideas about Scripture. And yes, it has to be a place where we can eat and drink and socialize. It has to be a place for worship and for fellowship. And these things are equally important. If we only ever go into the auditorium, into the sanctuary, and hear the sermon, and listen to the music, and pray the prayers, and then we go home, we've only done half the work of the church. The other half is eating, and drinking, and talking, and, well, being that third place. Even if it comes at a cost, turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. After the death of John the Baptist, Jesus withdrew to a boat private, 
privately to a solitary place, he is mourning the loss of his cousin. His cousin has just died. And he has to preach to crowds, and he just wants to be alone for a bit. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot. He's going by boat, by the way. And when it says to the other side of the lake, he was just preaching on the Jewish side of the lake. When it says the other side of the lake, it means the pagan side of the lake. That's going to be important in a moment here. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Now, what did I say about this crowd? They're, they're Jewish. Oh, they're Jewish. The crowd is Jewish, but where are they? They're in pagan country. Are they going to find any home that serves something kosher? Are they going to find some place that separates the ham from the cheese? Are they going to find some place that, if it's the right time of year, has unleavened bread? No. He's sending them out. In other words, what the disciples are saying, go send them out so they can find some food. Where? Where are they going to find food? They can't eat what is in those towns around them because that food is unclean for them. Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Now, I would love to break down the numerology of this, but I don't have time. I just want you to pay attention to the loaves and the wine. We saw that in our offering reading, remember? That Melchizedek gave Abram, in Genesis chapter 14, bread and wine, and Abram gave thanks. And here Jesus does the same thing. But now... What's the importance of the bread and wine? When Jesus is establishing the church, he establishes Peter as head of the church. In John chapter 21, he reinstates Peter. And he says to him, feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Does he say preach to my sheep? Does he say sing songs with them? Does he say pray with them? He says take care of them, feed them. That's the most important thing. And if you don't believe me, look at the kind of church Peter established after Christ ascended to heaven. In Acts chapter six, in those days when the number of disciples was inc increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Peter's doing exactly what Jesus said. He's feeding the sheep. But some are being overlooked because of factions. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Sounds like Mary and Martha. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man of full faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, and a number of others. They presented these men to the apostle, who, to the apostles, excuse me, 
who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to faith. Because there has to be both. Finally, we come to our passage in 1 Corinthians. It doesn't take long for this to go terribly, terribly wrong. Because as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17, some are still being fed while others go hungry. The, the responsibility has been turned over, but now they're having potlucks, and no one's really overseeing this anymore. Of course, we're also talking Corinth rather than Jerusalem, and pagans rather than Jews. We're talking about a whole cultural shift here, and Paul is trying to teach this group in Corinth to do what Peter has already taught the church in Jerusalem to do. And Paul is saying you have to all be equals. It doesn't matter if you're Hebraic Jews. It doesn't matter if you're Hellenistic Jews. It doesn't matter if you're converts to the faith. You all have to be equal in the Lord's sight. Men, women, children, slave, free, as he says in Galatians, we're all equal. And so make sure no one goes hungry while others are gluttonous and get drunk. This is how we have to take care of one another as the church. And as we expand from a house church to a church that is hosted, hopefully, by another church, and even further, to our own building, I want to keep in mind that we're not only a church that preaches the word and that takes care of one another's spiritual needs. But I want, I want to make it known that it is equally important that we must still take care of one another's physical needs. That if some are cold and some are not, we have to take care of one another. And so that means calling each other when we're sick. That means... <sighs> That means sharing food and checking up with one another. And that is the hardest work of the church. Because I tell you I was doing that, I rushed through my sermon prep today to do that. And I'm glad I did. Because I would much rather preach to you a terrible sermon than leave any one of you out in the cold. I would rather that we have songs where slides are missing <laughs> if you hadn't noticed, then that any of you has not been fed. And I would rather be going to parties with sinners and perchance sinning by getting drunk than that anyone should ever be lost. That's the kind of church I want to be. And I hope that's the kind of church you want to go to. I hope that's the kind of church you want to help me build. Because that's what kind of church this is. Amen. Amen. Amen.